born uh, near Scott Air Force Base. Dad was an Air Force veteran, actually joined uh, during World War II uh, in the Army uh, in food service and then transferred over to the Army Air Corps and then was one of the charter members of the Air Force when it was created in 1947. Oh, nice. So we moved around a lot, born in Illinois and then uh, picked up from there and moved on to the Azores Islands where my younger brother was born there. Uh, and then uh, back to Indiana at that point and then back over to North Africa and just outside of Marrakesh uh, and lived there for a little while and then back into uh, Nebraska again and then later on back down to Arkansas. Well, some, some Department of Defense schools and some of them were just, we lived off in the community and uh, local schools there. So, and that was always a challenge because you're always the new kid, especially in the civilian schools. Um, so it kind of learned to get a little bit tough, not always accepted when uh, you move into these small communities sometimes. So learned at an early age how to fight. Went straight into the military right after high school and graduated from down at Greenwood. We moved back there 1968, just a few months before the big tornado took out all of downtown. Uh, and I went 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th there and then went off into the military. And then started, once I got into the military, then started going to college and taking some courses. And never did get a degree, but always kind of looked for the courses that might help me on my job or I thought that I'd benefit from. So, so just kind of grew up and always knew that I kind of liked that military life. I liked that structure. Uh, and like I say, growing up on military bases and things like that, it's just a very natural environment for me. So early on, probably junior high age, I was already looking kind of toward military. And, and started out, of course, in, from Greenwood and then, uh, you know, joined up and shipped us down to San Antonio for basic training at Lackland Air Force Base. And then from there, I joined with a guaranteed job of interior electrician at a civil engineer, uh, which is something I had no experience at all and had construction experience, but nothing with the electrical field. So then shipped off to Sh Shepherd Air Force Base, Texas, went to their technical school there, and then my first duty assignment was at Tinker in Oklahoma City. And it's there that uh, in 1975 uh, time frame that got married and started a family. Got out of the service, 1977. The economy was looking good. I was an electrician making, when I stopped and figured out all the hours I was working, about 50 cents an hour. So uh, at that time, an electrician around the Northwest Arkansas area here uh, was making about $5 an hour, and that was just crazy good money. So I thought, well, I'm tired of wearing a uniform. Uh, tired of being told what to do, so got out of the service and went to work for uh, local electricians uh, and then some construction companies. And then the economy turned bad around 1980-ish or so, uh, and I got thinking, boy, that job back in the military. We'd had another baby at that point. Our daughter was born, uh, and we had to pay for that out of our own pocket because I couldn't afford insurance. Uh, and the security that the military offered started looking a little bit more appealing and I got thinking you know that wearing that uniform's not so bad and you know I'm kind of having to answer to somebody anyway so why not get back in so we rejoined and, and re-enlisted again back in uh, about 1982 I believe January of 82 went back in the service after a couple of years with the National Guard here in Fort Smith but when I went back in they didn't have any need for electricians they had enough of them uh, so I wound up uh, getting into production control, which is kind of the next level up, and that's the management of all the civil engineering trade. It managed all the work orders and, and projected jobs and things for the electricians, the plumbers, the HVAC, all those people, roads and grounds, heavy equipment. So I was in the management team then at that point and did that for um, a couple of years at Luke Air Force Base out in Arizona. Uh, that's where I went back in uh, in 82 and then stayed there for a little bit and got shipped off TDY to a place called Gila Bend, Arizona. And then at that point we had the Air Force every year required that all the members receive a what they called the 205-57 briefing and it was a protection of the president. And it came down and said that if you, and we had to have the briefing, had to sign off on it. It was to say that if you hear, heard of any threats against the president or members of Congress or anything, you have to requirement to report those. And the OSI, the Office of Special Investigations, 
would always send their special agents down to do that. And it was at that time that we had, uh, after the briefing, the agent that came down and did the, the presentation said, oh, by the way, we're looking for enlisted that want to become special agents. And I was starting to get a little bored uh, with production control and civil engineers, having a good time, but always looking for new adventures. So I raised my hand and said, yeah, we'll give it a shot. So about a year long investigation, uh, it's, it's quite a, a process to get in it. They only select about 1% of the people that even apply for it. So in the OSI, we have fraud investigators, we have criminal investigators, we've got guys working narcotics, we've got counter espionage, folks that are running double agents, all that stuff. And we work with our counterparts, the alphabet soup of federal government, the a FBI, the uh, ATF, uh, Secret Service, all the different organizations we and actually train with them uh, and then and then anytime we sh share some jurisdiction then we just kind of step right in you can't tell who's who at that point. My specialty changed a few times but I worked narcotics for a while in Germany, I worked fraud, I uh, worked counterintelligence so trying to get those first few years I try to get you exposed to everything so that you can kind of see what you're best suited for, and then you start kind of moving off into specialties. The last group I was with, we were security for unacknowledged programs, black programs, uh, and that we would keep, our job was to keep all those programs out of public's eye until they needed to be deployed uh, so that's where the, you know, the 117, the B2, and all of a sudden it just shows up. It's like, wow, it's been in development for eight years. Uh, our job was to make sure that it stayed black. Worked all over the place. Yeah. It started out when I got back in, like I said, OSI. Um, they immediately sent me to Rhine Main in Frankfurt, Germany, and, and did our three years there from 86 to 89. And then from there we moved to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio just outside Dayton, Ohio, where the Air Force Museum is. And that's where we stayed for almost 14 years. Um, retired up there and then stayed up there and worked a little bit longer. And that's where I was working with our, our what they call our PJs, and that's the black programs. Did that from 1986 until 98. And the last four or five years is when I switched over and got uh, what we call the our Region 7, which was all of our black programs. And that, then, then you literally disappear from the rest of the Air Force and the world. It's the most fascinating thing in the world. And one thing we did in our last, before I switched into the black world, and then that happened a little bit after we got in into the black, um, we used to do these human vulnerability assessments. And that's where our black programs and some of our very highly classified programs would, they needed to test to see, and I always kind of compared this to having a dam, and you've built this dam around your program, and you want someone to come in and test it to see if there's any leaks. So we, I was on a team, a very selective team out of Washington, out of our headquarters, and it was basically three of us, and then we would select handpick people that we thought would be suitable for operations, but we would become spies against our own programs. And we were given um, unlimited resources to do anything that a spy would do, that a foreign intelligence service would do, anything. So we would go in and, and in an organization, the commander would come up and say, okay, I've got this program. I'm not gonna tell you what it is. I want you to send a team in and this is our building, this is where we work, and I want you to tell me if you can find any leaks about information, what we do, what we're working on, where we're going, things like that. And we did, I want to say I think I did 13 of these over the years uh, all over the world. So we moved back from Ohio back to Arkansas, and then uh, we had property here that we'd bought back in the 70s, so we went ahead and built a house on it. Uh, and. Uh, there, but that we came back then, and then I was out on the tractor, completely retired, done with everything. We were okay financially, um, and I got a call from the folks at our headquarters in Falls Church, 
and they're like, we'd like you to come back to work. I'm like, nah, not really interested, thanks. And then they said, well, we want you to open up an office in Little Rock. We need things done there. You're going to be the only employee in the state, and this is an international company, nobody in Arkansas. I said, no. And then they started throwing some information out there about salaries and stuff. I said, hey, let me go look at it. So uh, it was more money than I'd ever made. Uh, so I did go down and work in Little Rock. We actually took the job. Uh, you know, military, I've always tell people, we're already kind of hardwired, especially those of us that did careers, and we're hardwired for service. So um, it's kind of like a sheepdog. You've got to give them sheep or they, they kind of go crazy. And I'm, so I got involved uh, as soon as I got back into the Greenwood area with our local Veterans Foreign Wars group. And after a, a meeting or two, they decided to make me commander. And that, that was in like 2008, I think. And wound up staying commander until just this last year. Uh, we we're recognized nationally at our post there for being a community service uh, post, which we're extremely proud of. We are a outreach. We want to do things in the community. Yeah, you need something done, you come to the VFW, we'll figure out how to get it done. We'll get the manpower, the resources to do it. So that's how our post, that's the personality of our post. You know, there are still some that you know struggle with that, but we don't want pity. We don't want people looking at us thinking, oh, poor, poor old guy is sitting there. We want, to, we want, especially our young veterans, we want to say, I want to be part of that group right there. We're doing good, positive things in the community. You know, the veterans are, are such a huge asset. I mean, the kids, and we always try to tell people that are in private businesses, if you get somebody that's done a hitch in service, you've got a guy that knows how to show up on time, you've got a guy that knows how to dedicate themselves to a project. There's some care and feeding you've got to do so that they don't get disillusioned and burn out and leave you, but it's a very... Um, I guess kind of an energetic type person that you're going to get and, it, and they're an asset. So we try to get people to look at that and then hire these vets especially. And we also try to get our vets to get in some of these organizations like VFW, American Legion, DAV, uh, all those groups so that we can get the lobbying power that we need in Congress. Uh, we need to have folks uh, that can get up and say, okay, we've got a million and a half members, listen to us. Uh, so we always try to encourage to, you know, to just keep numbers up. But there again, there's some health benefits for these young vets, mentally, mental health, if once they get involved in these organizations, if they are good, positive influences like we think we try to be uh, at our place and not, we don't want to come in here and just dump a bunch of alcohol on you, which is not going to help if you've got depression and you've got some traumatic stress that you're dealing with, you know, alcohol is not the answer. Uh, so we're, like I say, our post is dry, and uh, we're, we're strictly a community outreach. So we try to get the young folks involved in that.